The Focus of Freedom, from the Freedom Tabernacle Baptist Church and Freedom Tabernacle Ministries in Atkins, Virginia. Home of Camp Freedom, a regional outreach to our youth. Freedom House, offering counseling, intervention, emergency shelter, and food distribution. And with our many missionary partners, reaching out around the world with the light and love of the gospel of Christ. And now, the focus of freedom. So upon the infallible, eternal, undeniable word of God I stand. Good evening, everybody, and welcome into this week's edition of the Focus of Freedom. Tonight, just like every Sunday night at this same time, we welcome you in the highest, holiest name there is, the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So get yourself in here now, and I hope that you'll just lay the remote aside and stay with us for the entirety of tonight's Focus of Freedom. We're going to be talking about repentance. Repent. Why? Well, there's a lot of good reasons why we as God's people ought to have repentance as a perpetual thing going on in our lives. So you stay tuned for the message. We'll have some music and singing for you, the Lord willing. As always, we're just tickled, honored that you're watching, and we thank you from the very bottom of our heart. One week from tonight, 7 p.m., November the 5th, we begin revival, Midway Baptist Church up on Iron Ridge outside of the beautiful little scenic city of Galax, Virginia. Brother Myron Dalton is the pastor. We appreciate Myron, known him ever since he was a child. And for some of you that live in around the Smith County area or Shady Valley, Tennessee area, you remember Brother Bryce Barton, uh, well, the old red-headed preacher from back in the 50s and 60s. Uh, Brother Myron is, uh, is Bryce's nephew and in the family there for years. And so I always look forward to being with all the folks there at Midway. 7 p.m. Sunday through Wednesday night, 7 o'clock each night, including Sunday. So if you cannot be with us physically, you can certainly be with us prayerfully as we pray for this revival and all the other revivals going on throughout the viewing area of living faith, especially here in these highlands and in these mountainous regions, that God would just stir his people that we could get unified and then powerized by the Holy Spirit and just see some wonderful things happening for the glory of God's grace. And then two weeks from tonight, that'll begin on December the 12th at 6 p.m. on Sunday night, November, I believe I said December, November the 12th two weeks from tonight, 6 p.m. at the Cornerstone Free Will Baptist Church right there in Bristol, Tennessee. Uh, just south of Bristol on 421 where Route 44 intersects there. Uh, Cornerstone Free Will Baptist right over there on the hill. Uh, you can see it. And most everybody knows where it's at. We've been there several years, Brother Gary Roulette and all the folks. And we're looking forward to it two weeks from tonight. And uh, we're looking forward to that. We really truly are. And we'll say more about that next week. So those are the announcements in regard to revival. And let's certainly pray that God will revive us again, that we can rejoice in him. But more importantly than that, what's going on in your world, in your life, in your mind, uh, in your soul? I hope you're right with God. I hope you're doing your best to glorify the Lord in your life. Although none of us are perfect, uh, we grow each day and we have our struggles and our inevitable battles and circumstances and situations that can just vary extremely from moment to moment. But whatever happens, we do have the constant companionship of the Lord. So I want you to know he's there with you where you are. If you're there in even an intensive care cubicle there in a regional hospital somewhere, uh, if you're there in the hospital room, perhaps battling cancer, there at home and you're looking at a bunch of chemo or radiation treatments uh, in the near future, whatever calamity, upheaval, turmoil has invaded your life, just take you a big deep breath. I know a lot of times it takes us humans a while, but we adapt and adjust and we move forward for as so many people have said, we have no other choice. But we want you to know tonight that all of us here at Freedom, we want to come along beside of you via 
the focus of freedom and try to be a source of encouragement and a resource of strength as we worship the Lord and then as we get into the word of the Lord. That's the only reason why we're on the air, to try to be a, a vehicle that the Lord can get his gospel out to the lost that may be viewing and then his encouragement and strength and guidance and grace to all of us who are saved. And if everything's going well in your life tonight and we just tickled to death, rejoicing with those who rejoice, but let us all remember that someone somewhere needs our prayers. So Father, would you use tonight's focus of freedom as a resource of blessing and encouragement. We think of the elderly viewers that are getting on up in age and the old physical house just ain't working like it used to. Uh, but Lord, down in there, our inward person, we're being renewed every day. So encourage the elderly and the sick and those who may be having struggles with their marriage, their family, their finances, their, their health whatever it is, Lord, we're going to cast our cares on you knowing that you care for us and we're going to sit back here and we're going to receive your ministry and your therapy and your help and your strength and your wisdom. So Lord, all of us tonight, may we just sit down at your feet and listen to your word and be touched by your spirit. Help us, God, with encouragement and strength and insight. Everything we'll ever need, we got it in you, and we're grateful for that. In Jesus' name, this blessing we pray, amen. Now, thanks again for watching, and may the Holy Spirit minister the word and strength and blessing to all of our lives through this week's edition of The Focus of Freedom.
Chapter 3, last verse in the last book in the Bible, Revelation chapter 3. And as you see there, verse 19. Now I hope you have a copy of the word of the Lord with you. And you can look down here. This is the church of the Laodiceans. Seven churches of Asia Minor here in chapter 2 and 3 of Revelation. We won't go into any recount of any of the seven. But just to say this, they were all in different locations, therefore different cultures, different diets, different dialects in many, many instances. And so they were all different. And yet one God over all, and he loves us all. And that's the Lord Jesus. And that tells me that you don't, God doesn't expect you to be like me. Nor does God expect me to try to be like you. You're an individual. There's only one you in the entire universe. Past, present, future. And God does have a plan for you and he's got a will for you. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So when God loves the world, you can put your name in there. For, so, for God so loved me, and say your name, that he gave his only begotten son, that if I would believe in him, I wouldn't have to perish, but that I could have everlasting life. So don't let anyone try to make you someone else. Don't let any faction or force try to coerce or manipulate you into being who you could never be. You can only be who God intends you to be. And I do believe it is very possible for you to have contentment with who you are. If the devil's trying to get you to be somebody else, that means you're discontent. You're not satisfied with who you are. And so there's the trick of the devil. You're not satisfied with God then. Because God didn't make a mistake when you were born. God didn't make a mistake by making you who you are. But the devil wants to give you a false identity. Only God can give you a true identity. So these seven churches were different local churches and yet they represented the one true church, the body 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, all of them had some negatives and positives, like I do. I've got some gifts and then I've got some liabilities. I've got some things that pleases God. I've got some attributes and actions and attitudes sometimes that displeases God. So it is up to me then to try to, Philippians 2, work out my own salvation with fear and trembling by allowing God who lives within me to work on me every day by admitting to myself I'm not perfect yet. I'm going to stumble, I'm going to fall, I'm going to do a lot of things, but I can have dependency upon the dependability of God Almighty who will forgive me, help me, strengthen me, bless me, straighten me out. He's long suffering with me and extremely patient and for which I am so grateful, aren't you? So they all had positives and negatives like we all do. The Philadelphia church, the church of love, he didn't say much criticism about them. And then the Laodicea church, he only had criticism for them. He didn't have any commendation whatsoever. And if you believe in the chronology of the seven churches, in other words, they're a historical timeline from the first of the church age to the close of the church age, then Laodicea would be the church of the latter part of the grace age or the church age. Now, I'm not preaching that to be fact because so much in regard to prophecy and the intimate study of the revelation can certainly be discussed and debated. But what can't be is their attitude and therefore their actions. So we come down then to our text, verse 19. Jesus said to the church of the Laodicea, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. The best parents in this house of God this morning are you parents who will be willing to discipline your child and to train them and to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. A parent that just leaves their child to the child's discretion to do whatsoever they want to do, self-expression, whatever it is, I don't believe that's good parenting myself, and parenting is a tremendous challenge in and of itself. A parent that would not grab the child back out of the flow of traffic? (laughs) Now, does that make sense? How far do you want to take a lie? The devil will take a lie all the way to destruction. I can't tell my child what to do. I've got to let it go. Well, what if you're walking across a mall parking lot and you see a teenager coming about 55 mile an hour and your child's about to get in the path of that vehicle? Are you going to stand by with a grin and say, well, I'm just going to let it express itself? No, I think you'll take charge then. Now, with that said... God is our heavenly father. And he's going to at many times, I think, do just what he said there, rebuke and chase them. And if you don't listen to the verbal rebuke, you're apt to get the physical chastening. If you're as old as I am, you remember back in the day when the teacher said, sit down, she meant it, or he meant it. And that was a rebuke of your behavior. And if that rebuke wasn't sufficient to stop that unnecessary, unwanted behavior, then the chastening came. How many in here are as old as I am and you remember the paddle when it was in school? Boy, that's a lot of hands being raised. Now we've learned or we've been told that that's abuse and that'll teach violence and that'll train a child to be violent. Well, I was always told that theory became fact when you could touch it, smell it, see it, you know, prove it. Now, if that premise was true that the paddle created violence, then why do we have metal detectors now? Why do we have violent fights now? Seemed like that wasn't necessarily true, was it? So people tried to change the truth into a lie all the time. But the truth will make you free and a lie will make a slave out of you. Don't ever forget that. So he said, as many as I love, I rebuke and chase and be zealous. That just means to give full attention to something. Not just half-heartedly, but wholeheartedly, you're gonna listen to what God is saying. 
to be zealous therefore and say it out loud with me, this one word, repent. Say it again, repent. So the title of our little discussion this morning, repent, exclamation point, why? Question mark. I had a pet peeve driving a school bus for 36 years. I don't know why they do it, but they do it. They did it yesterday, they, did it t- they do it today, and they'll do it tomorrow. I say, sit down, and they say, why? That got old brother Mike a little tore up. <laughs> I wasn't allowed when I was a kid to chirp back, why? <laughs> sit down, because I said so. <laughs> but it's just a natural inclination in all of us to say why, what for? Then we would have to summon patience and have a skull session and say hypothetically and these little hillbilly children say what? (laughs) If a car pulls out in front of us and I've got to slam on the bus, you're gonna get hurt. And they accepted that explanation. One day, a new kid jumped on the bus and I said the same thing. I said, sit down. He said, why? I didn't have to say a word because little Janie put up a little finger and said, let me tell you why. (laughs) Clear communication sometimes goes a long way. God has multiple reasons for telling us to do certain things. And those reasons are never for our detriment but always for our betterment. The word repent, now that's interesting. People say, well, that's because I gotta confess my sins. And yet when one goes back into original language of the Bible, you start seeing that repentance is really not the mental vision that most of us get. No wonder Paul told Timothy to study You preachers who are here this morning don't ever discredit or discard education because when you do, you're making Paul out to be a liar. He told the young preachers, study. You don't necessarily need a little slip of paper from some human institution, but you had better please God with your scholarship and with your learning and grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance is a mental process having to do with reflection or afterthought. Now, unlike wisdom and favor, which we've got up there, which are processes of forethought. Interesting verse, Luke chapter two, verse 52. Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So even Jesus Christ himself grew mentally, physically, and spiritually. You can take a little snapshot of that and share it on Facebook if you want to. Now, if Jesus grew mentally, physically, and spiritually, and if Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature, that's his mind, that's his body, and that's his spirit. And he being the God-man, one with the Father, if Jesus prayed, don't you think I need to pray? If Jesus sought the tutelage and teaching of the Holy Spirit, don't you think I do? the audacity of any of us who think we know it all. But we've got to grow in knowledge according to 2 Peter 3, 19. And let me say it again, I've said it countless times. When I get to the point to where I think I know everything, I severely limit myself because then it's impossible for me to learn anything. And even in favor with God, So if Jesus grew mentally, physically, and spiritually, then it's obvious. I should too. And you should too. Because we're not perfect at all. So forethought has to do with wisdom and knowing the results of my action before I take them. But when we don't have wisdom, forethought, That's why we make so many incredible mistakes. When someone is void of wisdom, they'll go ahead and take a little meth. They'll smoke it, they'll inject, they'll do anything. 
And yet this fentanyl, we've had two deaths lately. Two physical deaths tied to my own personal family of laced heroin. Dead immediately. One in Ohio and one in just recently in Florida. Just a day or two after my own dad died. This is an epidemic. Randall wasn't wasting his breath when he was talking to God up here about this a few minutes ago. It's not just permeating big cities. It's right here in southwestern Virginia and has been. And instead of getting less, it's getting more. Instead of getting lighter, it's getting heavier. Wisdom says if I do this, wisdom looks ahead of the action and sees the results of the action. And wisdom knows that if I make a bad decision today, it's going to put me out here in a destination tomorrow. Get wisdom. Study the book of Proverbs from chapter 1 all the way over to chapter 31. It talks over and over and over and over again about the mind of Christ being operative and functional in my life to where I pause just a minute and supplicate and talk things over with God and then I know a clear vision in my mind of the result of the action before I take the action and therefore I make a better decision and I don't do the action because I know The devil means it for my detriment. But he'll take momentary circumstances that inevitably will change and a lot of times naturally for the better if I just hold on. But he says, go ahead and do it. And the biggest lie he tells people, you'll forget your trouble for a little while. And so for a few moments of gratification by believing a lie. There's pleasure in sin for a moment. And then all of that disintegrates. And you've got so much damage and so many problems created. And then to make an additional bad decision, absent any wisdom at all, just takes you further away from the light and further away from life and further away from liberty, and further away from peace, and the more distance the devil and my own fleshly absence of wisdom takes me further and further away, and I look around my shoulder, and I'm way away from where I was. And the darkness can become so great, the light is so dim, And the devil's a liar, a thief, and a murderer. Now these drug dealers using this high-level pain medication that is extremely dangerous. And yet it's out here swirling everywhere. And those without wisdom stick death in their veins. The devil ain't playing. He wants you destroyed both here and afterward. That's the devil. Wisdom deals with forethought. Repentance deals with afterthought. Afterthought of behaviors is in order. Before there can ever be a change in behavior, there's got to be a change of mind and of purpose. Snap that one and share it, would you please? You got some wisdom up here on these boards. That's why you don't bother me at all if you take a snap of it and share it with somebody. Tell them this is what we saw in God's house this morning. It might help somebody. Stick your finger there in in Revelation chapter three and go back to the words of Jesus in Matthew seven. Now we're gonna read some verses and we need to read them. Chapter 7, Sermon on the Mount, the Lord Jesus Christ preaching on the Mount of Beatitudes. And Matthew chapter 7, he says this, Judge not that ye be not judged. 
Let me say this again. I've said it quite a few times last year out in revival. Jesus said, don't judge. That's what he said right here. Now, don't show hands, just think in your mind. How many times in your church-going experience over the last several years in your life have you heard fellow churchgoers rabidly judging other people? That's getting some chuckles. Is there a number that high in mathematics? And yet Jesus said, love one another. Now think with me in your mind. How many times in your church going experiences have you seen credible specimens of people honestly, legitimately loving people? Even as Jesus said, in their moments of unloveliness. Because even the Pharisees love the lovable. Jesus said, if you love the lovable, what thank have you? But I've told you to love those who aren't lovable. So what does that little quick pass by of a lesson say? We don't obey him, do we? We actually do the opposite. He says, don't judge, we judge. He says, love, we don't love. So if omnipotence from God is only triggered into my personal life through my obedience to God, there's your answer why we don't have the power of God operative in our individual lives nor in our churches. We can't do our own thing. We've got to do his thing. So repentance then is afterthought, as I said. So it's like the word supplication in Ephesians chapter six. It's not us doing all the talking to God. It's not us doing merely nothing but listening to God, which is far better than us doing all the talking, but it's a combination of the both. When we get alone in a prayer setting somewhere and we discuss things with God and we disclose ourselves honestly and completely and say, Lord, here I am and I present my body a living sacrifice. He knows me anyhow, but fear comes in in the flesh and we don't want to disclose ourselves to God. And so we start lying to God, to ourselves and everybody else because the God of this world, the force behind the Adamic human spirit wants to deny God and wants to replace God with some other type of God. And we get all discombobulated and we convince ourselves that we're okay. And it's all right to judge others. It's all right not to love other people. I heard a preacher not long ago saying that he despised these people out here in the world who was against us. That's fleshly. Is that what Jesus said? Is that what Jesus said when he went to the cross? Yes, he had some harsh words for the Pharisees, but he saved at least a couple of them. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. So how can we say with our mouths that we love the Lord and then with our actions we completely deny him? I believe old Gandhi hit the nail on the head when he said, I love Jesus, but I don't think much of his followers because with our mouths we say we love him and then with our lives we don't. So this brings us then to the definition of repentance. P repentance produces a change for the better. Read on what he said here in Matthew 7. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. If you cast out misery, you're going to get misery. Throw your bread on the water, Jesus said, it comes back to you. For with the same measure you meet, it's measured to you again. Now watch what he goes on to say in verse three. And why beholdest thou the mote that's in thy brother's eye, but considereth not the beam that's in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the, the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in your own eye. Now listen to Jesus Christ. He wouldn't be such a, pacifist preacher today or an apologist. He said it just like it was. 
He said, you hypocrite. You never talk to me about your sin, but you talk to everybody about other people's sin. You worry about a moat in their life and you don't even recognize the beam in your own. Let me tell you quickly what a moat is. You've heard me say that before. And us hillbillies here in these highlands, we know what a red oak tree is, don't we? You know, one of the best ways you can tell a red oak from a white oak, just wait a little bit and because the leaves hang on those red oaks all the time. They'll be the only trees around in this forest around Camp Freedom when in a few months, even in January and February, you see those old crinkled leaves all over a red oak. And if you ever went into the forest floor underneath a red oak and picked one of them up and just crunched them in your hand, they just crunch and disintegrate to nothing. That's a hillbilly definition of a moat. It really, nothing to it. So I'm going to get my mind and my life all agitated because I see Randall doing something I don't think he ought to do. Or I think he's violating our standards. Or he's varying from our scholarship. He's not going to get a seat in our sanctuary. So we worry about standards, scholarships, and seats. And we get all tore up about moats in other people's eyes. But a beam... That's the trunk of the tree. That's why they call it a beam. It's the main thing. And I ain't gonna get help from God if I'm worrying about you. But he's a very present help in my trouble. And if I look to God, he is the source of everything that I'll ever need. The choir was singing, I've got Jesus. What more do I need? I don't need anything else. Psalms 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. But the devil wants you dissatisfied. The devil doesn't want you powerful for God. He wants you puny for him. He doesn't want you to be a light. He wants you to be darkness. He don't want you to encourage. The devil wants you to discourage. So now we come down to what we're talking about in regard to repentance. You hypocrite, Jesus said. First cast out the beam out of thine own eye and then you shall see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. Give not that which is holy unto dogs and cast your pearls before swine lest they trample them under, your, under their feet and turn again and rend you. So we've got repentance now. It's afterthought, it's a mental process of thinking things over and recognizing and realizing that I've got to do better. It promotes an amendment to our attitudes and therefore our actions. See that one? Eight times back over in Revelation two and three, eight times you'll find the word repentance used or repent used here in Revelation two and three. You still have your Bibles open, don't you? Chapter two, in uh, verse five to the church at Ephesus. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent. Think about it, Jesus is telling them. Just consider your own life. Don't worry about the moat in everybody else's eyes. Worry about the beam in your own life. Because I've got a plan for you. I've saved you from your sin and if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian yet, we all pray you'll be saved today. And then allow the God who saves your soul to be the absolute Lord and authority of your life. So we won't go through the different seven. You can look up those words for yourself. They're right there on you. Right there they are if you want to jot them down. Or again, take a little snapshot of them. You don't even have to do any writing. Isn't technology amazing? <laughs> a lot better than the old pen and paper, I must say. But we come to the Laodicea church and my goodness. My goodness. Verse 17 and 18 ought to make every one of us pause before we leave here this morning. And when Jesus said repent, he was talking about giving your mind over to God and thinking about your own personal life. Now get this real quickly. It's something that I learned about it the other day. Repentance number one, repentance before God. 
I don't have to repent to you. I don't have to repent to man or women or anybody else, friends and Bethels, but repentance before God. And laying out our behaviors, our attitudes, our actions before him and then listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit in conjunction to the clear teachings of the scriptures of God, then modification can be made in my life every day. And I can get stronger and smarter instead of weaker and dumber. Repentance of our sin before him. And then listen to this and look at it out of pity for those whom our actions have affected. Listen to me, church. Do not we as the church of the Lord Jesus bear some responsibility in the social ills that are eating up our country and community? How did this happen? How have we drifted so far? How is so many of our family members dying at the hands of the devil through drug addiction? Oh, it's their fault, their fault, their fault. That what? The world's not the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Jesus said that we are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. And when the salt loses its savor, what's it good for but to be cast out? The behaviors of the last 50 years within the church has contributed greatly to where we are now. When the world initiated this agenda of changing America, we were silent. I'll raise my hand right now before God and tell you one thing. We might not have did everything we ought to did, but God gave us information of activist groups and all these different ones who were changing the country. Tried to tell people you needed to be still about fussing about the church and get unified. But when we personally preach unity of the church back in the 90s, pastors rejected it. They said, you're an ecumenical preacher. You're a worldly preacher. You're not a word preacher. If they're not like us, we're not going to have anything to do with them. And so we retreated back in our little denominational pockets and we were ruined by tradition of man and rudiments of the world, as Paul told them in Colossae. And we guarded our little scholarship and our little standards. And we threw rocks at anything and everything that wasn't exactly like we are. Well, how's that worked out now? So what's the answer? Our actions have affected people. Does that grieve you or do you want to stick that backbone up there with that old pharisaical pride and say that preacher's not telling the truth? It's not my fault. It's that low down bunch out there. They're the ones that's the fault. It's not my fault because I'm good and holy. <laughs> Just keep convincing yourself of that. Repentance before God. Now the question before we leave this morning is why? God said repent. Well, like the little kid on the bus, why? Let's have a real quick skull session and go back to verse 17 of Revelation 3 and what's the first word? Because. I'll tell you why. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Now if that's not pride, what is it? If that's not self-sufficiency, what is it? Rich with what riches? What goods are you talking about, Laodiceans? We're increased with goods. We have need of nothing. And one of the most challenging, sobering word from the Lord Jesus in the New Testament is right here. Knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, Blind and naked. Wow. People say, well, I don't like to be called that. I ain't calling you that. I'm not calling myself that. That's what Jesus is saying. 
The word wretched means lawless. Not obeying God, but obeying yourself or man. Not just wretched, but miserable. I ain't gonna ask you to raise your hand, but how many miserable churchgoers y'all know? I know quite a few of them. Ain't happy with nothing, don't like nothing, criticize everything, they're just in a mode, they don't like it. But let some person they do like sing that song, then that's okay. Let somebody they do like do something, that's okay. We triage, we pick and choose, we do our own thing. And many times far removed from the truth of the word of God and God Almighty. I'm not making that up. I'm reading to you the old KJV 1611 book. Wretched, miserable, poor, poor in good works, blind, can't see the lost, naked. What's that? That's the Adamic human spirit and all of that uh, character of Adam and conduct of Adam coming through. That's what he means by naked. Now, are we gonna leave it right there? No. Mark 7, 9, laying aside the commandments of God, Jesus said, you hold the tradition of men washing pots and cups. You see, the Pharisees were more worried about washing dishes than they were about a lost world out here. Jesus would help the, the derelict, the dope head, the, you know, the maniac of Gadara, Mary Magdalene of Magla, and all these things, and the Pharisees didn't like that. But boy, they made sure all those dishes was washed up. So Jesus said, you've, let, you've laid aside the commandments of God and held the tradition of men washing pots and cups. Luke 10, 40, that's why Jesus said to Paul Martha out there in the kitchen, said, Martha, you're cumbered about with much serving, but Mary's chosen the good thing that's not gonna be taken away from her. Man, I hope you're following along here. I, I referenced Colossians a minute ago, but it's chapter two, verse eight. Beware, Paul said, big exclamation point, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. So why do we need to repent this morning, freedom and everybody else that might be watching or listening? Here we go. Number two, it's verse 18. I counsel thee to buy, well, I counsel thee, I advise thee to buy of me gold tried in a fire that you may be rich. Ain't it sad this morning that we've discarded the riches of Christ. Forgiveness, forbearance, long-suffering, goodness, grace, love. We've discarded all of that and we've clung to the fool's gold and counterfeits of this world of pride and jealousy and division and strife falling to temptation. Are you hearing it? You say, well, I like people run the aisle and shout. I don't like serving. I don't like sermons like that. I like ice cream and dessert too. But you better eat you some beans and taters and steak once in a while or you're gonna die. We've discarded the riches of Christ. That's what's happening here. Then thirdly, disguise the righteousness of Christ. Oh, white raiment that thou may be clothed. Romans 3 and 4, by faith we've received the very righteousness of Christ. And when I put on the righteousness of Christ, people can't see the unrighteousness of Adam. The robes of the righteousness of the Son of God are so that people would see him. My reaction to action my attitude, my behavior, my thoughts, everything is hidden, lost in Christ with God. Now we're a new creation. But isn't it sad that the Laodiceans had discarded the riches of Christ for the fool's gold of this world and had laid aside the righteousness of Christ for religious performances. And then finally, darkened the responsiveness of Christ. What do you mean by that? I salve, anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. The old devil wants to blind us like he did the sinners in 2 Corinthians chapter four. At Sychar, when the woman at the well had been married five times and was living in adultery at the time, and 
Jesus said, if you'll ask me to give you a drink, I'll give you a drink and the water that I'll give you will be in you a well springing up into everlasting life and you'll never thirst again. She said, give me that water, Lord. <laughs> she said, are you greater than Jacob, our father, which gave us this well and drank of it himself? And then she went on down there and she said, we hear that Messiah's coming. That's Emmanuel, God Almighty. And he said, I that speaketh with him, he. And she dropped that old bent up holy old uh, uh, water bucket of hers. Can you imagine? He is the God of Jacob. She went running back down to town and told all her acquaintances and friends, come see a man. And they all got out there, headed out to Jesus, and in the interim, Jesus was talking to the disciples, and they were put out the fact that he was talking to a worthless woman. And he simply said this. He said, I've got meat to eat that y'all don't know anything about. And then he said, look on the fields. Jesus saw an old sinner and he saw a potential child of God. Jesus saw someone in drugs and he knew they could be delivered. If you look with the eyes of the heart of Adam, you'll think there's no hope. But if you'll let Jesus anoint your eyes with Isaiah, give you spiritual sight you'll know there's hope for everybody and doing my little thing I can reach a limited number of people but getting involved and immersed into his thing of the gospel we can reach more people the question is who do you love the most Jesus or yourself are you willing to go to higher heights with the shepherd are you willing to climb along through the valley of the shadow and get up to more table land do you want to grow do you want to expand do you want to be able to reach more do you want to be able to do more do you want to go with God then repent why so we can be more in tune with him and do more for him in the days to come than we've ever done in days gone by. He can take your doldrum and give you excitement. He can take your boredom and give you joy. He can take your doubt and give you anticipation that the best is yet to come. Not just in that life over yonder, but in this life now. I hope we've answered that question. Repent, exclamation point. Why, question mark. And I hope we'll all repent every day and embrace tomorrow for the glory of God's grace in your individual life and in our collective life as a church. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. And I pray, oh God, that we will all do a little supplicating and we will have some supplication with you. That we'll have a few conferences just between us and you about how things are going and get your opinion through your still small voice on how we're doing as we disclose ourselves and then discover afresh the completeness and totality of you. And I pray, oh God, that we will do that and that we will pursue that, our personal uh, interaction with you and our uh, relationship with you would be enhanced through our intimate fellowship with you. So God speak, and that's, that's what you've taught us tonight about repentance. It's just afterthought, and then doing better, amending our attitude, and therefore altering our actions in a better direction, and to be smarter, and to be stronger, and to be more effective uh, in our outreach personally to a lost and a dying world. And so, Lord, if we have setbacks, if we stumble or fall, you'll pick us up and redirect us and restore us and revive us. And so we have confidence in you. And we know that that's not a, just a get out of jail card free, you know, and do whatever we want to do because your perfect love casts out fear. 
And so we want to love you back because you first loved us. And so minister to all of us as your people in this great topic of repenting, uh, that we would have that gold tried in the fire and I salve and the white raiment that we've talked about tonight. So Lord, just seal your word into all of our lives and may your gospel be received in those lives who may not be saved yet. And then Lord, may your word be the guiding light in our lives as your people. And Lord, as we reach up, you're reaching down. Every time we look up, you're looking down. As a matter of fact, if we're saved, you're right here in our heart and you know all about it. And we just want to increase and intensify the awareness that we have of our oneness with you and the potential that exists in the individual Christian and in all of these local churches. Lord, if we'd come together and, and just humble ourselves and do what you tell us to do, then my, my, my Lord, you can move so amazingly that we can see things happen like we've been praying that we would see happen for so long. So all of our viewers, we lay them right down at your feet and know that God, they are in your care and they can't get no better care than yours. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, with anticipation and faith, hallelujah, and praise, amen. Always wonderful to pray for you and pray with you. Now, as we leave you tonight, just a real quick reminder, two weeks from tonight, I think that's December the 12th, uh, November the 12th, uh, November 12th, I'll get that right in a minute, uh, at 6 p.m., we begin revival at the Cornerstone Free Will Baptist Church. Then 7 o'clock, then on the 13th, 14th, and 15th of November. Now, one week from tonight on November the 5th, 7 p.m. through the Wednesday night next week. One week from tonight it begins. Midway Baptist in Galax. Pray for these two meetings, but pray for all the revival services. God knows we greatly need revival among us as Christians. And when repentance comes to the Christian, revival will come to the church, and I think an amazing restoration would happen in the country. Don't you? I really believe that. Well, as always, thank you for your prayers and your love. My, the outpouring of love in the home going of my dad there a few weeks ago from so many of you, all the texts, all the calls, all the cards, I just thank you. We really appreciate it. And your continued love and support, man alive. We couldn't make it without the prayers of God's people and the power of God, I know that. But your love is such a blessing and I want you to know we appreciate it so very, very much. And I hope you have a great week, everybody. And let's just do the best we can to bring glory to our God, to his gospel, and to his grace. As always, thanks for watching. Till next time, may God bless you richly. Then may he use you for his glory and to be a real blessing to someone else.